Significant. 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 Welcome to Significant Life, the podcast for women who want to live, lead, and serve from an anchored place. I'm your host, Janice Anderson, wife, mother of three, CEO, and lover of all things Jesus. I firmly believe that strong women need an even stronger support system. So whether you need to get it done or come undone, this is a place where you can do it all without second guessing who you are, disconnecting from those you love, or undervaluing your irreplaceable contribution to the world. Regardless of what you're facing, this I know for sure, you were created to live and enjoy a significant life. Let's dive into today's episode. Y'all, OMG, welcome back to this week's episode. We're in episode two, um, part two of our series called Relationship Matters. If you did not check out last week's episode or the last episode um, where I talked about, what did I talk about? Relationship status. Yes. If you did not check out the episode entitled Relationship Status, where are we really? Pause. Pause this. Come back to this and go back and check out that episode. Make sure you listen, you take notes because that was really, really good. And it was some really necessary information and share it with someone. All right. Because we're going to pick up today off of the work we did in the last episode. Now, welcome back today. We're in part two of our mini series called Relationship Matters. And in this episode, what I want to talk about now is the relationship reset. Because clearly, for many of you, after you had a chance to just assess where you were, to really look at your relationship status, you realize that there were a few things that is not where you want to be. Last week, we decided that there were four rankings that we could give our relationships, one of four things. They could either be excellent, which means they were thriving and they were ideal. It was the best it can be for right now. We know that no relationship is perfect, but we felt that where we are is great. It's thriving. Or in your relationships, you probably, you could have ranked it satisfied and that is suitable. It's good. It could be better. But really, I don't have any major complaints. It's suitable. Okay. The third ranking that you could give your relationship was surviving. And listen, you're like, we still living. It's still here. But really, that's like a poor rating. And then the fourth ranking that you could give your relationship based on our um, ranking from our assessment last week was failing. This relationship is losing strength It is not functioning the way it was designed to function. Now, this ranking we leverage across all categories, at least five categories of our life's relationships. We started with our relationship with ourselves. Then we went to the relationships in our home under our roof, um, among our four walls. Then we looked at our relationship at work or business with our colleagues, whatever our vocation is. And then we looked at our relationships um, with our friends, you know, our social connections, the people we do life with. And then lastly, we looked at our relationships across our community at large. So take that ranking, go look at your results. What did you discover? Where are you if you were to give a name, give a ranking to the relationships in your life? Where are they using that ranking system? And now you're caught up to where we are today. Because based on that ranking, some of you have decided that you need a relationship reset. Notice I didn't say abandon the relationship. I said a relationship reset. And so in today's episode, we're going to talk about what does it look like to reset my relationship? And is that even possible? I'm so excited. Let's get into this conversation. So listen, Have you ever asked someone to do something for you? You asked them to do it. They did it. You didn't like it. You didn't like the way they did it. You didn't like the outcome of what they did. And quite frankly, you were a bit disappointed or kind of felt slighted about how they showed up. 
And then they in turn felt frustrated and low key angry, almost mad because they felt like you didn't, they, that you didn't appreciate what they did. You ever had something like that? Okay. You all know by now that I'm a mother of three generations of daughters. And I remember when my oldest daughter, she was probably about eight years old and um, maybe she was a little younger and I was asking her to clean her room. And if you have kids, you know, the way kids clean and the way adults clean, they are very different. And so I said, go clean your room. And she went and cleaned her room. She wanted to go somewhere with her friends. And and she's like, okay, mom, you want to come check it? And I was like, yes, let me check your room. Let me see. And when I checked her room, y'all already know, y'all already know when I looked at the room, that was not clean. Now, unlike me when I was a kid, she did not push all the stuff under the bed and in the closet and call it clean. Yeah, she didn't do that. Praise God. But what she did do is like she just put stuff. She just straightened things up and like she moved one thing from here to there, but not into the place where it's designed to be. And it was like, this room ain't clean. That was my response. I was like, this room is not clean. Have you ever had that? You ever had that? You ever ask your child to do something? They did it. And then you greet them with this critique and pretty much cutting them down, letting them know you didn't do this. You didn't do a good job. Why are you being, why are you rushing? Why are you not giving it your best? Why are you being lazy? You know, some parents may say that, you know, why are you, you know, all this, why are you doing this? When in reality, can, can you raise your hand if that's you? When in reality, until you demonstrate what good looks like, they're going on what good looks like to them and they're operating off of that picture of what good looks like. And it's not until you demonstrate what good looks like to you that they actually have an idea of what good is or what clean is. Now, I, I would love to take credit for discovering this on my own, but I didn't because around about that same time um, that my daughter did this, and this is my oldest daughter, she had to be actually like five. And I thought she was eight, but she really was like about five years old. I attended this parenting seminar. And what I realized in the parenting seminar is there's a difference between telling our children what to do and teaching them how to do something. And what he shared with us, the instructor was like, many parents are guilty of telling their kids what to do and not teaching them. And he went on to tell us that for 18 years, you have 18 years, parents, to teach them how to live this life, to show them, to model for them. So they're going to get, they're going to mess it up. They have 18 years to mess it up because when they get out of the house, you're not going to be there with them. Man, it was so eye opening to me, but it was also very challenging and convicting to me as a mom because I was just like, you know what it means. How many of you said that? You know what it means. You know this room ain't clean. Well, how do they know? Did you, because I'm saying it's not clean, but what does clean look like in your relationships? I hope you learn. I hope you see where I'm going. What does good look like? And have you explicitly described and even demonstrated or even go further, taught the persons you're interacting with what good looks like to you? Because here's what we know about relationships. Even if we're raised in the exact same home, we still see things differently. You know, we process things differently. I'm the oldest of five. And the things that I remember and how I recall what my mom taught me and what she showed us and what I gathered from my experiences are vastly different from what my siblings experienced and what they've gathered. And we were in the darn same house. I'm country. That's what Dern came out. Excuse me. So it behooves us if we want to have relationships that are of high quality and of good health. If you remember from last week, go back and check the episode out. Sound health that are thriving relationships that are I, our ideal relationship instead of relationships that we're settling um, poor, or even worse, relationships that are losing life and sucking the life out of us then we, we might want to consider defining what good looks like. So today, as we're getting ready to reset our relationships here, I just want to talk to you about a couple of concepts that, that are going to be pivotal for you resetting your relationship. 
And that first concept is preference versus principle. Preference versus principle. So as we start thinking about what good looks like, I want to caution you um, as you're defining what good looks like and as you're thinking about this, I want to caution you from a perspective that I've seen many people who well-meaning, well-intentioned say, what well, they should know better. They know better. They, you should. You should already know. You know better than that. How, how do they know? And, and sometimes the how did they know, um, the answer on the other side of that or the you should already know is based on a preference that we've turned into a principle. Okay, you know, by now, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and define the words for us to make sure that we're all on the same page. So get your notebook, get your pen. Let's just go ahead and do a little vocabulary lesson on what these two words mean and how do we overlay these into our relationships. So first we have preference. I learned so much when defining this. So the definition for preference is the power or opportunity of choosing the power or opportunity of choosing. This is something we choose. A preference is a choice. The second definition that I found in Webster's, y'all know me, I went to the original, not really. Um, it is the act, fact, or principle of giving advantages to some over others. Preference, to prefer to give um, advantage or yeah, you, we've used it before preferential treatment over, you know, so this is an advantage. It's, this is a choice. This is, this is not the rule. This is not the rule. This is my choice. Are you following me? So there's a preference, you know, I'm 5'11". So if a person were dating me, they had to prefer tall women because I'm a tall woman. A woman, I'm not a tall woman. I'm a tall <laughs> I'm not tall women. I'm a tall woman. I also am African-American. And so for a person to choose me, they had to choose willingly an African-American because this is who I am. This is not the only way. This is I'm not the only choice is the choice that they have made. You got it? You got it. It's a preference. It is the power or opportunity to choose. Now, for all my Bible scholars, because I've seen people misuse these two texts, um, quite often, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but because I talk to people who read the Bible, love their Bibles, or want to grow in their love of the Bible, I wanted to share this with you. So, you know, in scripture, the only time we, we hear the word or see the word preferring one another, we see that we see it twice in scripture. We see it once in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. We see it the second time in first Timothy verse, um, chapter five, verse 21. And y'all, can I tell y'all what this word means? First of all, it does not mean what you think it means. And if someone has been using it as it relates to relationships to tell you that they should prefer you, you should prefer them over somebody else because as your spouse, you should prefer me over everyone else. Can I tell you what that means? Okay. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 10, the scripture reads, be kindly affectioned, one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. I bring this up because the Bible nerd in me wants to share this, but also this is again, punctuating the necessity of us to have relationships and to know how to show up in relationships. And from a biblical context, it is required, not suggested, but this is a requirement of us as believers that we are kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and in honor prefer one another. So what does prefer mean in that verse? So glad you asked me. It means to go before and show the way to go before and lead to go before as a leader, when I prefer, when I'm showing up in brotherly love, because this is a, a loving affection as um, prone to, no, I'm sorry, kindly affectionate means loving affection, prone to love tenderly. This is showing a tender heartedness and a love towards someone else. Get this because you're like, hold up. 
that type of love typically is displayed between parent and child or husband and wife. But in this verse, they want to, the author wants to make sure you know that we're not just talking about a parental love and a spousal love, but we're actually talking about a brotherly love. So how we treat one another as brothers and sisters with loving affection, tenderly, here it is, and in honor, out of honor, out of respect, I'm going to what? Prefer one another. I'm going to go before you and show you the way. I'm going to show you the way. You Can I tell y'all what that means? Let me give y'all a Janice version in regular like, language, okay? So what that means is you acting a fool right now. And, and you lied. You, you lied. I know that's a lie. I see you lying to me. So I'm going to lead the way. I'm going to show you how this should be handled. I'm going to show you a better way to handle this. I'm not going to lie and deceive. Instead, I'm going to demonstrate what showing the truth, what walking in truth looks like. You avoid conflict. Does anybody hear me? Is this Michael? You are avoiding conflict. This is example number two. I, because I am being kindly affection one to another, I'm not going to avoid the conflict. Instead, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to demonstrate how to have healthy conflict, how to have dialogue, how to disagree and how to do it in a way that is honorable because I'm doing what I'm preferring one another. I'm preferring you. Okay. That's one, that's one definition. Okay, okay, okay. So preference, that is not the English way for preference, but this is what the Bible way is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Paul was talking to the church at Rome. And now he's talking to new believers. And now listen, listen, listen. And the second time, the only other time in scripture, this word is used, not even the same word, but the English word preferring is used in scripture is found in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. And let me read you that text. It says, I charged thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Listen, Timothy is telling in front of everybody, I'm in front of God, Jesus, and all the angels. Listen, that you observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So then he said, I'm charging you. Listen, I'm holding to your keep. I, I'm, I'm letting you know that I'm holding you to this right here. That you do what? In, in, in front of God, in front of Jesus, in front of all the angels. That you observe everything that I'm speaking of right here. And you do it without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So if you want to know what he's talking about, you got to read what he's talking about. He's giving all of these laws and rules of how to interact with one another, how to treat the widows, how to treat older people, treating younger people, younger people, treating older people, women, treating the young women, old women, treating the younger women, young women, treating the old women. Y'all get what I'm saying? Read it. And it's in first Timothy chapter five, verse 21. And he's saying everything that's listed right here, everything that I just said, observe this, listen, without preferring one another. So what does that mean there? In that verse, it literally means an opinion formed before the facts are known. He said, I need you to do this. I need you to follow everything I just said without forming a, an opinion before the facts are known. Without a prejudgment, without a prejudice. So here, preferring one another is an opinion formed before the facts are known. It's a prejudgment, a prejudice. Okay, very similar. I am going to treat you a certain way regardless of what the facts are because I'm preferring you because I'm prejudiced because I have a prejudgment. Okay, so... In relationships, when we think about what good looks like, we have two, two spectrums of what good looks like. We have our preference is our choice. Or if we look at what scripture says, it is 
how we're going to show up by leading for other people and show them the example of the way or or it's our opinion that we are maintaining this opinion before the facts are known. It don't even have nothing to do with the facts. This is just our opinion. That's your preference. OK, and then you have principle. So a principle is a comprehensive and fundamental law, doctrine or assumption. This is the fundamental law. And it's comprehensive. Everybody operates off of this law. It is a rule or code of conduct. So in your relationship, you are operating. When you think about what is good, what is ideal, what is the standard? There are two types. There's the preference and there's the principle. And often we've held people hostage. We've held them to a standard that is our preference and we treated it as if it were principle. For example, m- men wash cars of the women in their lives because that's what men do. All, all men know that, you know, if you got a girl, you're supposed to wash her car. Says who? All women know when you get married, you're supposed to just stop what you're doing and go to the door when your husband comes home and say, hey, honey, I'm so glad you're home. Why my face look like this? Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Those of you who are listening, you don't get to see the facial expression I made as I just said that. I touched my own spot. (laughs) Y'all know I'm married. And I remember the early days of our marriage. My husband had some preferences that he did not communicate. And because they were not principles in my eyes, I did not follow through because I didn't even know. Okay. Okay. We're going to get to that in just a second. So when you think about the relationships in your life, when you think about your relationship with yourself, when you think about your relationship with those under your roof, when you think about your relationship at your workplace or your business, when you think about the relationship among friends and you think about your relationship among those in your community, what is governing you? What's governing what is good? Is what is good, what is ideal, what is right in your eyes governed by your preferences or by principles? That's the first question I want you to ask yourself. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to look at this this next idea before I give you your assignment from this episode. And that is this idea of expectations. Because we have preferences and principles that are governing our mind and governing our perspective of what is good and what is right, what is ideal. We also have expectations that are accompany that. And these expectations, ladies and gentlemen, are the reason we feel tense, are the reason we experience conflict, are the reason we get disappointment, we feel disappointment, or the reason we feel joy when interacting with people, regardless of the nature of the relationship. Because there's this expectation that we have. And if we're not careful, we are setting ourselves up and those that we are in relationship with for failure, um, Because with expectation comes a responsibility, a duty of the person holding the expectation to communicate that expectation. So let's talk about the four types of expectations. And then I'm going to give you your coaching assignment from this episode. And then I'm going to see you next week for part three of our Relationship Matters mini series. Okay, before I do that, let me give you uh, our brief commercial break. This episode is brought to you by the Significant Life Masterclass Series, OMG. If you haven't been to a masterclass, you want to make sure you come to the next one. These are deep dive opportunities for you to come close, close, close into my community to work with me and be among a community of women, like-minded women like you, who are committed to going deep on a specific area of your life, whether it be your finances, um, your health and wellness, your life-giving relationships like our next one that's coming up, your um, career, one of the five categories of life. We go deep on those categories of life together in a closed door session. It's an amazing experience. Um, Not only am I coaching 
I'm also facilitating and equipping you with new skills, new strategies for maximizing this area of your life. Because as you know, in this community, our whole goal is that we are equipped to live, lead and serve from an anchored place. I love the masterclass series. We do them on a day where most of us are off from work or we take time off from work and we go deep together in community. And I just happen to be the leader. Well, we have a masterclass coming up and it is on April the 30th. So excited about that. And the, um, What is it? (laughs) I'm trying to get the words out. And in this masterclass, we're going to talk about how to create and cultivate life-giving relationships. Y'all, you don't want to miss this masterclass. I'm going to have three amazing women as our um, featured speakers. And then I'm also going to let you see behind doors of what life is like with my life circle, some members of my life circle. So I don't do life alone. Now I don't, but I used to. And before now, before, uh, yeah, I don't do life alone. Let me back up. I don't do life alone. I used to, though. I used to. I used to be afraid to have deep connections, and I really wasn't trained. Relationships are hard, and they're messy. And people are people. They're human, and we're flawed. And I didn't know how to navigate those things well. And because I didn't know how to navigate the flaws of of humanity well when in intimate connection with others, even my own flaws, I steered away from deep connections. And then I got healed. (laughs) I'm just going to call it like it is. And I learned some skills and and I got courage. Um, And I started diving into relationships again. And I'm very excited to introduce you to this, like a sneak peek of the life, some of the life-giving relationships in my community and in my world that keep me flowing, that keep me being the woman that I am. And so um, in addition to the amazing speakers that we're going to have, we're going to talk about parenting, we're going to talk about um, romance, and we're going to also talk about um corporate environments, personal advocacy boards and professional advocacy boards with our with our guest speakers. I'm also going to let you see what me and my life circle talk about. So join me, go over to my significant dot org forward slash masterclass and reserve your spot. Girl, you will not regret it. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, invite a friend or two or three. All right, back to our episode. Let's go ahead and look at this thing called expectations. What are they? What are expectations and where do we get tripped up? An expectation is an, the act or state of anticipation. It is willing and wanting something to happen. It is the state of looking forward to or waiting for something. And a lot of times in relationships, we have an expectation based on our preferences. And not only do we have expectation, can I tell you the four things I want to tell you about our expectations? Number one, we have expectations that are expressed. You know, I want it because I'm a communicator And I love to talk and I understand not just talking, but the act of receiving and processing um, communication. I tend to be very verbal and very expressive. And so I am often oversharing my expectation. I'm saying, hey, for me, success looks like this. And I didn't learn that always. I didn't learn that always. I didn't operate with that mindset always. I actually had to learn that, like what I, the story I told you earlier, when I was um, dealing with my daughter, I had to show her what I expect when I say clean the room. So for mommy, a clean room means all toys are in the toy pen. Your bed is made. The pillow looks like this. There's nothing on the floor. There's nothing underneath the bed. You get what I'm saying? I'm, I'm being very explicit. A lot. Of, so for me, when I say clean the room, it's not according to your expectation and your preference, your choice. It's this is the expectation. Well, when we're in a relationship, if we are not 
um, clear about our expectations, people make up their own. They make up their own. They make up their own preference, their own rule, they, they, their own standards for what is right, what is ideal, what is good, and what is thriving. You know, just think of any relationship. Women, We this happens to us all the time. We will think a relationship is absolutely horrible, and the man will think the relationship is amazing. Like, where are you? Are we in the same relationship, sir? Come back, Janice. Okay. So we have expressed expectations. Those are the expectations that we have shared. We have communicated. Then we have unexpressed expectations, just like the name suggests. It's when we have expectations that we haven't communicated because for whatever reason, everybody know that. You already know. I mean, that's common sense. Have you ever said that? That's just common sense. Yeah, common sense is not common. It's not common to everyone. Common sense, I think the the statement goes, common sense is not common knowledge. Yeah, I I never knew. My grandmother said, I lack CS. I I didn't know common sense. I had book sense because I could read it out of the book and I know what the book said. But common sense, yeah, what's common for me is not common for you. The third one is unrealistic. So we have expressed expectations, unexpressed expectations, unrealistic expectations. For me to expect that my daughter at five years old is going to clean the kitchen like I would at whatever age I was as her mother is unrealistic. She's not thinking like a mother. She is five. Some of us have expectations of others that are so lofty, so far-fetched, so unrealistic. They don't go with the times. They don't go with the human to think that a mother of three who's still nursing, can nurse and can show up fully with cooked dinner and clean house and combed hair and slim waist and um, well-groomed children every single day without missing a beat and a good attitude is unrealistic if she has no help. I'm just saying. And then the fourth pipe of expectation is outdated expectation. Hey, what worked when my husband and I were first married, those expectations don't work today. You know why? Because when we were first married, we just had Jasmine and Jada. We didn't have the baby. When we, like when we had, when we started this thing, it was, it was, it was one less person. We were younger. And so those expectations are outdated. They're no longer relevant. So oftentimes in our relationships, we want to make sure that we do a reset communicate what we expect based on communicate our preferences and uh, make sure that we are not making our preferences principles and that we're giving the other people in our life, whether it be under our roof or at our workplace, the opportunity to arise to the occasion. And so here's your homework. Here's the life work, as I say in our community with the women that I get to awesomely coach and lead. Here's your life work. I want you to take time today and maybe over the next seven days, and I want you to think through what will make each of those categories of life, each of those categories of relationships, what will make them excellent? What will make them ideal in your eyes? What does it look like for those relationships to thrive? Because before we can reset the relationship, we have to decide what is good for me. And so I want you to just take time to journal. You can put right in a post, however you want to, but take time to just assess what is good for me at this stage of my life, at this place where I'm, I'm at, where I am at this place where I am now, because I don't think where I am at is correct. What is good now? What do I need now? Go down every category of life and just write or draw a picture and get clear on what good looks like. This next we're going to talk about how to communicate that, how to communicate. Because sometimes our relationships are not ideal because we don't know what ideal is. And if we do, we've never communicated it. Well, that's it for this week's episode on the mini series of Relationships Matters. This is the beginning of what I'd like to call preparing yourself for a relationship reset. Getting clear on what looks good. What does good look like to me? I'm 
Janice Anderson. I'll see you next week. If you know already, this is good. This is juicy. This is helpful. I would love for you to subscribe to this podcast. Also invite a friend or two. Check out our masterclass series. I'd love to have you there. It's at www.mysignificantlife.org forward slash masterclass. Until next week, have a good one. Goodbye.